So this is the first Ebola video. Incidentally, for those who don't yet know me, my name is Karma Singh. I'm one of Europe's leading healers and researchers and teachers. And there are a number of things that we need to bear in mind when we are considering Ebola. Now, it does have a very high fatality rate. It's one of those diseases. One of, not the only one, one of. It is, however, very, very rare. And at the moment we're talking of around two to two and a half thousand cases over an area, oh, maybe two thirds of the size of the USA. So that's not even one per major city. You know, even, even, we're looking at a very, very small problem and a lot of hype. Now, we also need to consider what is Ebola? Where did it come from? Now, at the moment, according to the medical literature, the first cases appeared in 1976 in Africa. And to date, almost all cases have been reported in the same belt of equatorial Africa. And there are good reasons for this, and they have nothing to do with disease, but a lot to do with politics. There is, however, one event in human history which goes back much, much further. It actually goes back to the years 1340 to 1342. And this was a time in which a disease then called the Black Death spread rapidly right across Europe and actually killed around one third of the entire human population of Europe. The reason it's sensible to take note of this is that although you probably, as I was, taught that the Black Death was bubonic plague, when we look at the symptom descriptions, they bear no resemblance to bubonic plague. In fact, bubonic plague first became endemic in Europe in the 17th century when there were massive changes in the diet. The Black Death, from the symptoms described at the time, looks to be virtually identical to the symptoms of Ebola. Now, it makes sense to look at the politics of 14th century Europe and the politics of present-day equatorial Africa. And we find two very, very interesting parallels. We find a period of chronic wars, chronic warfare, and we also find government policies. Now, there wasn't a government then as the way we know it. There was an aristocracy who decided everything, and then there was you and me who just had to grin and bear it. But the policy was to, amongst other things, deliberately suppress agricultural self-sufficiency exactly the same thing as you now have in equatorial Africa. You have chronic civil wars, you have chronic banditry, and government policies which have the effect of suppressing agricultural self-sufficiency. Effect, 14th century Europe, present-day equatorial Africa, chronic malnutrition. Everybody well, not everybody, but a large number of people who are extremely undernourished. Now, Professor Bruce Lipton, whom some of you may know, did, when he wrote the uh, introduction to my book, The Flu Fairy Tale, which goes into what I'm about to say in rather more detail, noted that excavations of the mass graves from the Black Death show that almost everyone, every person who died and was mass buried in the uh, Black Death was suffering from chronic undernutrition, chronic malnutrition. 
This should tell you something about the disease itself. Now, there are a number of other interesting things which we have to bear in mind. One of which is that there is no realistic scientific evidence to support the postulate of infectious disease. Now, I say I use the word postulate. In science, there are different stages. So, first, somebody comes in with an idea, and it's called a postulate. Then, he, she finds evidence supporting this idea, so he's able to say it may be true, and then it becomes a thesis. Then goes further, and other researchers accumulate a large body of evidence, which um, supports the original postulate, and then it becomes upgraded to a theory. And then, at a much, much later stage, and if zero evidence is found to the contrary, and over a great many years, uh, more and more evidence is found to support the original postulate, then it becomes a scientific law, like the law of gravity to which there are actually exceptions, so it's really only a theory, but <clears throat> leave it as a law for the moment. Now, infectious disease isn't a theory. It isn't a thesis. It's a postulate. And the people who came up with this postulate, who spread this postulate, which is um, primarily Louis Pasteur in France and Robert Koch in Germany, they both knew at that time that it wasn't true. However, they used their power and influence with the rich and politically well-connected to spread this postulate as though it were almost a proven fact, almost a theory. It isn't. It's just a postulate. Well, it's not even a postulate, because when you go into the science of it, more and more you discover that the postulate is nonsense. The postulate is that particular bacteria or virus cause disease. Now, we just take one fact which proves that this isn't true. And this one fact if the postulate was true that uh, a virus or a bacteria causes disease, then anyone who comes into contact with it is very, very likely to become ill. What happens? Well, what actually happens in an epidemic between 1% and a maximum of 4% of the people who come into contact with this so-called disease-causing germ actually become ill. That's what an epidemic means, between 1% and 4%. That is, 96 to 99% of the people who come in contact with it are completely unaffected. That is a very, very, very important scientific fact and one which we have to bear in mind when dealing with Ebola, Ebola and uh, a number of other similar type of problems. The odds are, and here we're just speaking about statistical odds are, that almost everyone on the planet is immune to Ebola. However, let's look at where outbreaks occur, what are the environmental conditions? And this is so important. Do study Bruce Lipton's work on epigenetics because this shows the true causes of disease. As I say, with my book, The Flu Fairy Tale, I've gone into this in some detail with one specific problem. I'm writing a much larger book at the moment which goes into it in much, much greater detail. 
but look at the common environmental factors where if you get a disease outbreak what are the common environmental factors so what have we across equatorial Africa chronic malnutrition chronic undernutrition across Europe in the 14th century chronic undernutrition chronic malnutrition which brings us to the nature of the Ebola virus itself. What did it actually do? Well, it destroys collagen, or appears to destroy collagen. Um, there's a little bit more needs to be known on this, which is why, as I say, this is the first of the Ebola um, videos. There may well be more to say on this topic. Now, collagen, you might have heard the word, uh, is a very, very important protein in all mammals. This is the protein which holds everything else together. Uh, around 30% of all proteins are collagens. And without collagens, your body would literally fall to pieces. Your intestines would burst, your eyes would bleed, Anywhere where there's high pressure would go blip, and fluids would squirt out. This is exactly what Ebola looks like in the terminal stages, where so much collagen has been destroyed that the body literally falls to pieces. And this is the reason why it was called the Black Death in the 14th century, because you get enormous areas of the skin turning black where the cells have ruptured because the collagen has been destroyed and it's just full of deoxygenated blood the black death Ebola probably two names for the same thing so the problem we have to resolve is what is the nature specific nature of the collagen weakness which allows Ebola to destroy entire human structures. Probability is that it's a severe mineral deficiency. Now this is not unknown. It is not unknown even to medical so-called science which has actually nothing to do with science. It has a lot more to do with the marketing requirements of the pharmaceutical companies. But even there it's known that you can repair collagen so cheaply that it's ridiculous. And here we're talking about five cents per month. And you can do it in your own home. Uh, following this, I will put up, um, no, I will now link into this video, a video showing you exactly how to do it. And the most important thing to note is, you must use either Himalaya salt or another royal salt. Don't use table salt. And although there may be some sea salts which are usable, this you it's not possible to say with any degree of certainty that all sea salts will do this for you. Basically, you need a royal salt. Now, royal salt is pink. It's not white. Um, it's pink because there are 84 different minerals in there. And 84 minerals are exactly the minerals which the human body needs. Now, to make in Himalaya solar, obviously you need Himalaya salt, which is in the bag on the right, and a glass container with a lid. Now, this is so that the water doesn't evaporate because it's going to be in there for quite some time. So you take one lump of Himalaya salt, put it in the glass container, add good water, then put the lid on 
and give it a quick shake. Now, you've got to give this some time, about 15, 20 minutes. And if in that time, there's still some salt left in the jar, then you have your soli, your saturated solution. And what you do is you then take one teaspoon of this mixture, well, this saturated solution, you put it into a drinking glass, fill it up with water, and then you drink it. So you make and take this mineral supplement every day. So once you've made it, it's called a Himalaya Sole. To keep your um, mineral levels high and to boost them if they're low, you take between three and five teaspoons of your Sole in a glass of water every day. It could be that simple. I can't say for certain at the moment, but it could be that simple making yourself immune to Ebola. As more research becomes public, I will publish it and hope that we get some sort of feedback on this as well, especially from uh, sci real scientists like Professor Lipton or um, Stefan Lanka, who was one of the leading, world's leading virologists. And we can begin to get a true picture of what is really happening. And bear in mind, we're talking about a tiny, tiny number of people from a population of several hundred millions. That's all. And the reason it's a tiny, tiny number is because it's a tiny, tiny number who are actually so deficient in nutrients that Ebola is able to do them some damage. So, pick her up and keep smiling. It's good for you. Smiling is a very, very healthful thing to do. It's good for your entire body, your entire mind, and your entire life. Namaste. Thank you.